hear the heart cry of the prophet, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. It is a cry that still echoes throughout our world today. From the killing fields of Dafar, from the inner cities of Houston and Los Angeles and New York and Chicago, where unnumbered children will go to bed hungry tonight. From the indentured servants of India who must struggle for three generations to pay off a $25 loan, from the innocent girls of the sex slave trade of Cambodia and Indonesia, from the sickening squalor of the refugee camps of Palestine and the horror scenes of terrorist bombings in Israel, they and hundreds more like them all cry out, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. And O oh Lord, may it be so. In our day, we pray. Amen. The social justice stream of Christian life and faith focuses upon justice and shalom in all human relationships and social structures. This compassionate way of living addresses the gospel imperative for equity and magnanimity among all peoples. I'm going to share with you two very contrasting personalities as models for social justice. Moses, whom I'm sure that you know fairly well, and Benjamin Lay, someone I'm quite sure you don't know at all, but a most interesting, even intriguing personality. What can I say about Moses that you don't already know? You know about his escape as a baby in a waterproof basket, among the reeds of the river. You know how he was raised in the Egyptian royal household. You know that he murdered an Egyptian for the beating of a Hebrew and that he fled for his life to the deserts of Midian and married a daughter of the priest of Midian and waited for God's timing for barren year after barren year after barren year. You know of the divine encounter at the burning bush and of his reluctant return to Egypt and the dramatic encounters with Pharaoh and the plagues and the freeing of the children of Israel by the mighty hand of God, the outstretched arm of Yahweh. You know about Moses receiving the Ten Commandments and the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness and how Moses took the people to the edge of the promised land and then turned the leadership over to Joshua and stayed alone on the far side of the Jordan? Well, not really alone, for God was with him, and we are told that God took care of his burial. All these things you know, wonderful things, glorious things, but why would I think of Moses in reference to the social justice stream? Wouldn't I more quickly turn to those great prophets of Israel like Amos or Hosea or Joel or Micah Prophets who spoke out against all who would sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. People who would trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and push the afflicted out of the way. Prophets who called constantly the people back to the justice and shalom centered in the Mosaic covenant. And of course, that's exactly why I think of Moses when I think of the social justice stream. Moses was, first of all, the fountainhead of the great line of the prophets, Moses being the first of the prophets. In fact, Moses was such a great prophet among the people that he became one of the strands of messianic expectation that a prophet like unto Moses would arise and would teach the people himself. Deuteronomy 18.15 says it clearly. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like unto Moses from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet who shall speak to them everything that I command. Now Jesus, of course, was the great fulfillment of the prophet like unto Moses, as both Peter and Stephen 
explicitly tell in their sermons recorded in the book of Acts. And it was his role as prophet when Moses stood before Pharaoh. That famous, let my people go, was based upon a clear Hebraic concept of justice for the oppressed. But even more, Moses was the first judge and lawgiver. The great line of the judges in Israel began with Moses, creating under God the structure and arrangement of a just society was the role assigned to Moses. You see, the work of social justice doesn't always have to come from the outside. Indeed, it functions best from the inside where the creating of equitable structures become the foundation of a society. This in theology is called the cultural mandate, and it is at the heart of what Moses did for the emerging nation of Israel. Under Moses, God institutionalized a system of compassionate justice. In the Pentateuch, laws and regulations were set forth that had no other purpose than to bring justice into situations where none had existed before. Good laws, compassionate laws, laws for caring for the most helpless in society, the orphan, the widow, the sojourner, laws about the loaning of money in such a way that the financially needy were not exploited, laws to keep sexual exploitation at bay, laws of giving and taking a pledge, laws of gleaning, even laws of the compassionate care of animals and even the, the land itself and so on. Do you remember all of the regulations tied to the year of Jubilee? Slaves set free, debts canceled, the land returning to its original owner. At the heart of these teachings was a concern for justice and compassion for all people. Moses started that. The Hebrew word for justice is mishpat, and it is rich in meaning. It involved a morality over and above strict legal justice. It, it included observance of good custom or established practice especially the practice of the equitable distribution of the land. It was used so constantly in conjunction with the Hebrew word for righteousness that biblical scholars believe the two concepts should be viewed virtually synonymous. Remember Amos, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. That's why the social justice uh, stream is sometimes spoken of as social righteousness. All these ideas are rooted in the life and work of Moses. He is an admirable model for the social justice stream. More could be said here, I'm sure, but I hurry on to Benjamin Lay. I know you haven't heard about him, but he's one of my favorite personalities in the social justice stream. In my book, Streams of Living Water, I wrote about John Woolman, the great Quaker social prophet who was able to bring the Society of Friends to totally reject slavery before the American Revolutionary War, even to pay their former slaves for their years of service. If you haven't read his story yet, please do. He's a great one. But Woolman stood on the shoulders of others who were precursors and pioneers in developing the Quaker conscience about slavery. One of those precursors was Benjamin Lay. And I almost never get to tell his story, so here's my chance. Think now, early 18th century. Benjamin Lay was a hunchback, as was his wife, Sarah. And he was without doubt the strangest of the early Quaker abolitionists. The Quaker poet John Greenleaf Whittier colorfully described Lay as the irrepressible prophet who troubled the Israel of slaveholding Quakerism, clinging like a rough chestnut burr to the skirts of its respectability and settling like a pernation, pernicious gadfly on the sore places of its conscience. Born and raised in England, he and his wife Sarah set sail for the New World, actually for the island of Barbados, in 1718. They remained on Barbados for only one year, but this was more than enough time 
for Lay to have burned deep into his soul an unquenchable hatred for the institution of slavery. For those who don't know, Barbados was the dropping off place of many of the slave ships in those days. While on Barbados, Benjamin and Sarah came to be loved by the slaves and hated by the slave masters. Slaves would come by the hundreds on their free day to lay shop for food and instruction. They were intrigued by the remarkable similarities between the deformed Benjamin and his wife. They made up affectionate rhymes of how the little white man searched the world over looking for the little white woman. Finally, after a year, the Lays decided they'd had enough and moved to Philadelphia in hopes of finding a people more in sympathy with their anti-slavery beliefs. Philadelphia was a deep disappointment to Lay, for he found the leprosy of slavery had also infected the city of brotherly love. Shaking the dust of the city from their feet, Benjamin and Sarah moved to a farm some miles out, finally moving even further and setting up home in a cave. The Lays became notorious for the means they used to demonstrate the evils that they saw around them. At times, Lay would stand at the entrance to the Quaker meeting house with one leg bare and thrust into the snow. The unsuspecting worshipers coming to meeting were shocked and told him he'd catch his death of cold by such a practice. And Lay would reply sarcastically, Ah, you pretend compassion for me, but you do not feel for the poor slaves in your fields who go all winter half clad. On one occasion, Lay delayed a six-year-old child from going home, entertaining the child in his cave until dark. And frantic with worry, the child's parents came running to lay, crying out, Oh, Benjamin, Benjamin, our child is gone. He's been missing all day. Lay paused and then replied, Your child is safe in my house. And you may now conceive of the sorrow you inflict upon the parents of the Negro girl you hold in slavery, for she was torn from her parents by avarice. Probably Lay's most famous demonstration Maybe what I'd call a prophetic prank occurred at the yearly meeting sessions in Burlington in 1738. He had hollowed out a book and placed inside a bladder of pokeberry juice. Now, pokeberries were abundant in that area, and they produced a bright red juice, which would stain for sure. And next he put on a military uniform, anathema, of course, to Quakers, complete with gleaming sword uh, in its sheath, and he covered all of this with a plain Quaker gray overcoat. And he entered the yearly meeting sessions, which were the most important business gathering of the society, and he waited silently as many debated the slavery issue, some urging action, others urging caution, at precisely the right moment, Lay rose dramatically and spoke slowly. Oh, all you Negro masters, and especially you who do profess to do unto all men as ye would have them do unto you, and yet in direct opposition to every principle of reason, humanity, and religion, you are forcibly retaining your fellow men from one generation to the next in a state of unconditional servitude. You might as well throw off your hypocrisy as I do this plain coat. And he throws off the Quaker overcoat. And everyone saw the military garb and gasp. And Lay continued, It would be as justifiable in the sight of God, who beholds and respects all nations and colors of men with an equal regard, if you should thrust a sword through their hearts as I do this book. And of course, Lay draws out this big sword and he thrusts it through the book and then he sprinkles the blood over as many people as he could. <laughs> and needless to say, Lay was unceremoniously escorted <laughs> out of the meeting. <laughs> Lay wrote an anti-slavery book with a uh, real catchy phrase, a title. All slave keepers that keep the innocent in bondage 
apostates, he puts that in caps, pretending to lay claim to the pure and holy Christian religion of what congregation soever, but especially in their ministers by whose example the filthy leprosy and apostasy is spread far and near. <laughs> Obviously, Lay had not learned how to win friends and influence people. <laughs> he was able to talk Benjamin Franklin into printing the book, though in the book the publisher is discreetly anonymous. Franklin was upset with the pages. The manuscript was not numbered. And Lay replied, it's no matter. Print any part thou please first. I was able to hold that book in my hands from the rare book collection of the Huntington Library. It's a rambling rant of some 269 pages lashing out bitterly against slavery. Let me give you just a couple of quotes. The people are asleep in their sins, teachers and hearers in the devil's bosom in hell, and don't know it, for their preachers cannot and dare not tell them, for they are blind, dumb, blind, sleepy, dumb dogs. They cannot bark right, but they can bite. <laughs> I mean, not the most flattering description of the ministers of that day, is it? But it gets even worse. I know no worse or greater stumbling blocks the devil has laid in the way of honest inquirers than our ministers and elders keeping slaves and by straining and perverting Holy Scripture preach more to hell than ever they will bring to heaven by their feigned humility and hypocrisy. I mean, come on, Benjamin, tell us what you really feel. <laughs> Sadly, Lay was ultimately disowned by friends. He did, however, live to see the fruit of his labor. In 1758, a friend came to his cave, reported uh, that the Pennsylvania Quakers had come to unity in ridding their ranks of slavery. Lay listened to the news attentively, and after a few minutes of reflection, this battle-scarred veteran rose from his chair and he said, thanksgiving and praise be rendered unto the Lord God. Pausing for a moment, he added, I can now die in peace. And within a year, he did die. He was buried at the Friends Cemetery in Abington. So in death, he was reconciled to those who had rejected him in life. Now, what can we say about someone as erratic as Benjamin Lay? Ultimately, it took a whole new kind of leadership to bring Quakers to the point where they would voluntarily release their slaves and pay them for their years of service. But their work builds on the likes of Benjamin Lay. He blazed a trail through flaming sword, to use the words of George Fox. He had been valiant for the truth upon the earth. Perhaps his neurotic behavior was necessary to bring truth to power and shake a society so entrenched in slavery. Well, Moses and Lay, wildly different, but both seeking to let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. For years, I used to pontificate grandly about social justice. Then one day, while reading Jesus' story of the Good Samaritan, I began meditating on that question, who is my neighbor? And I realized that we so often define neighbor as our cultural equivalent. I mean, the person who's like us. But that Jesus redefined neighbor very simply as nibor, the person who is near us. And I realized that I had been too busy running around the country talking about social justice, too busy to even know who was my neighbor. And I decided to get to know the couple next door, an African-American couple. Uh, we got acquainted. We had wonderful times together. They knew that I wrote some things, but that didn't mean much to them. Uh, and I remember one time inviting them over to our house. Our kids were little and we played some board games, and we laughed and laughed until our side ached. And afterwards, I began to reflect, 
Why did we have so much fun? And I realized that I had laid down that everlasting burden of always needing to sound profound. See, Nibor, the person near us. Now, I want to close this session with a little exercise. I mean, if even for a few moments we watch CNN, we quickly get a feel for the pain and the sorrow that is in our world today. And if we would multiply that a million fold, we would get some idea of what God has to endure in seeing all the suffering and all of the evil that goes on every day in this world of ours. How it must break the heart of God. How he must weep over the brokenness and sadness of those who suffer. Enduring all the pains, all the screams, all the tears of the world's poor and the world's poor of heart. And for just a few moments, I would like to invite us to sit with the Lord, to join with God, if only in a small way, in sharing the burden of the sorrow of our world. We want to wait quietly, even those who are watching this on DVD, and do what little we can to join with God in feeling and bearing the heartache and heart sighs and heart sobs of those who suffer. Each time I will close by saying, we pray to the Lord and your response will be, Lord, hear our prayer. Now, let's be still in the presence of the Lord. In Swaziland, 10 out of every 11 people are infected with AIDS. In the rumor mills, the men are told that the way to cure AIDS is to have intercourse with a virgin girl. Children are born with HIV AIDS and they suffer. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. In the U.S., millions of people live without affordable medical insurance. Today, mothers and children are being turned away from medical treatment because they have no insurance. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. In South Africa, a woman or girl is raped every 53 seconds. We pray to the Lord. For the orphans of Darfur and Sarajevo and Iraq and Israel and Palestine, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And O oh Lord, we know how you hold the pain of the world. And how it must break your heart. Help us, O oh Lord. Help us to stand in solidarity with that pain. Oh, please, may justice roll down like waters. Righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. 
we pray, O Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Dallas, if a social reformer like Moses was catapulted into our day, what would concern him most? Well, certainly you're right to call him a social reformer. Uh, few people have, as we say, spoken truth to power mm. like Moses did. Mm. Mm. Um, that's an important role, and I think that uh, really he would be concerned about the, I wouldn't say lack of effort, but the inability of our our churches and our teachers and leaders to deal effectively with crying social issues mm -hmm. in our day. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that this has a lot of different dimensions, but I can't, I can't uh, omit what happens to children mm. in our culture. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. not just issues like abortion, but it's, it, it is the, mm -hmm. the way that children are, are not taught and not given a place yeah, yeah. And how life just runs over them many times. Right. And, and not just from things like poverty, but from a world where the lives of adults are organized so badly mm -hmm. to care for the things that are most important. And at the other end, the same thing with elders. Yeah, toward the end of life. Right. Yeah. And mm -hmm. people who just get pushed aside and can't deal with it because mm -hmm. our life is so complicated yeah. now. Uh, I think uh, one of the areas that I'm especially concerned about, and perhaps it's only because of where I spend my time, is in education. Mm. Uh, the, the terrible job we do mm. in trying to educate young people. Mm -hmm. And there's something so badly wrong with mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he would be also concerned about social structures and how money is distributed, uh, the unfairness of so many things that go on in the economic realm. Yeah. We get used to them. I think he would scream when it is suggested that the market will solve all moral problems. Yeah, right, you know? right, right. I think he would just um, bring that rod out or do something <laughs> you know, at that point, which, yeah. is tempting, which is tempting to do. But we have so many issues, yeah. and there's such alienation in our world, even within families. Yeah. And the lack of care and love in family, neighborhood, community, yeah. and as far as our influence can reach. You know, uh, that tradition is often spoken of as social righteousness, and that, that certainly ties into Moses. Uh, it? Yeah. Well, I like that better because, truthfully, justice has kind of been shrunk yeah. in our day right, right. and uh, is, uh, has become aligned with some very important issues, mm. but uh, not the, actually not with a broad enough range to deal with the very issues Right. Uh, that we, we're trying to deal with, like racial segregation right. and things of that sort, uh, which can't be dealt with apart from uh, the love. righteousness, yeah. yeah, the love of social yes. rights. Now, how has that been important to you? Uh, well, uh, again, it's partly, I mean, the central importance is I am primarily a thinker and a teacher. Uh and uh, concerned with moral issues. Mm -hmm. But I'm concerned with them at the level that Jesus is concerned with them. Mm. And so when I think about these issues, I think about them in terms that he gives us in his mm. teaching. Like, for example, getting the anger out mm. Mm. instead of stopping murder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And with reference to all of the fundamental social right. issues, right. Uh, one of the things that I say to the infuriation of many of my colleagues is there's no such thing as social ethics mm -hmm. because socials don't ethic, they don't <laughs> act. <laughs> now, there's a point to it, but I fundamentally, yeah. if individuals were unwilling to do what was wrong, there mm. would be no need for social ethics. Yep. Yep. And so I, uh, I, that's very important to me.